Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our breakout session on health information technology. My name is Beth Easting, and I work in the governor's office. I am the healthcare transformation coordinator for the state. And since that's not really that much to do, um, I'm also the health IT coordinator. And even though it is really impossible to do both of those jobs well, uh, and we're, we're, we're definitely trying to get some additional resources to deal with that, but I think that it is really important to uh, note the, the fact that these two jobs are together because health information technology coordination and policy and work is really very important to healthcare transformation. And so I firmly believe that it needs to be uh, closely interwoven as we move forward in changing our healthcare system. So um, I am very pleased to be here to talk about what we're up to in health information technology because that truly is crucial to everything that we're doing in healthcare transformation and in enabling us to reach our goal of the triple aim of better quality, uh, better health, and reducing the cost curve. So, um, this afternoon, it is almost an embarrassment of riches to have a panel that has so much to say. So I'm going to cut my remarks short. I have a very long um, introductory uh, PowerPoint, and I'm going to skip through it very fleetingly. Uh, and I hope that it is available for everybody to read, and I, I hope that you will read it because it is just packed full of important stuff. But we're not going to spend too much time talking about that because we want to listen to these people. Um, so let me briefly introduce the people that you're going to be hearing from. And how are we doing this there? for who these people are because they are all far too well known for me to have to spend too much time introducing them. But just to make sure that I do the right thing, um, Dr. Fink, of course, is our MedQuest director uh, in the Department of Human Services. Lauren, let me make sure I get your title correct. Uh, Chief of the Office of Planning, Policy, and Program Development at the Department of Health. Um, Dr. Chen, is the Chief of Clinical and Medical Affairs at Maui Memorial Medical Center. Christine Sakuda is the Executive Director of the Hawaii Health Information Exchange. Herb Schultz is the Regional Director uh, for this, this says CMS. He is the Regional Director reporting directly to Secretary Sebelius, uh, appointed by President Obama. And Eric Alborg, who's the Deputy Director for our Hawaii Health Connector. So, without any further ado, I am going to go ahead and start with this presentation. Um, so, this is a, a slide about why we are doing all of this. This talks about the costs, the inefficiencies in our system. Um, this, I think, is an important slide because it shows us what, uh, where we're starting from in transforming our information technology in the state of Hawaii. And we have a long way to go to get up to par. So in terms of our allocation of budget, the number of staff who are working on this, uh, the complexity of our organization in trying to put it all together. Uh, the value chain, uh, the New Day Vision, OIMT. Sorry, I'm going through this very quickly. I do want to make sure that you get some time to take a look at this, because this is a very important a uh, notional diagram for how we see all of the different parts of health information technology fitting together. And that is both here 
in the state and also in connection with our private sector partners. Alignment goals, design of the triple aim enterprise. I want to also focus a little bit on, on creating the learning health system because health information technology isn't just about improving healthcare delivery and payment, although that absolutely is crucial. But ultimately, it adds up to the learning health system. And so in order to continually improve how our health system performs, we've got to have data, uh, we've got to build that into information, use the information for knowledge, and ultimately develop a sense of wisdom so that we can take action and use all of this, this information and data that we have available to us. And then the last one that I want to uh, go over in any detail is Hawaii's major health IT projects. And so here is a list of the clinical IT projects that we're, we're working on. And uh, the, the first one, and I think I, I like to think foremost, healthcare transformation, which um, I am right in the thick of. Um, data governance, which you know none of this stuff can happen without competent data governance. Data repositories and analytics, which we are in the process of building capacity for. Uh, electronic health record modernizations. Medicaid meaningful use program, which congratulations, I understand the first payments just went out. Excellent. Um, public health data exchange and the Hawaii Health Information Exchange, HHIE, which of course is a private uh, entity, which is a state designated HIE. Um, and then lots and lots going on with the Affordable Care Act uh, that involves health IT. And so the Department of Human Services Integrated Eligibility System, um, the state data services hub between DHS and OIMT, and then the, the multi-sector support for developing the Hawaii Health Connector. So that really is pretty much um, what I wanted to mention in going through this. And again, these really are just extremely important information packed slides. So I hope you'll take a look at them. And I'm going to see if I can, well, I don't know what should I do with this. OK. <laughs> All right. Then our first speaker is why it's you. So nice to see so many colleagues. Um, I was thinking, uh, I'm not sure what it says about me with my enjoyment of being with other government employees, but it, I was thinking of Shawshank Redemption and Institutionalized. <laughs> uh, if you haven't seen them again, I recommend it. Decision support, reminders, both the clinicians, the patients, 
So a huge role in improving the effectiveness of healthcare. There's care coordination. How do we exchange information from caregivers, uh, either from patient to provider, among providers, uh, so people have the necessary information to provide the care that's uh, effective. Over treatment, again, from best practices, so how you can program, again, more of that decision support into electronic health records, and using registry functionality um, to support proactive population-based management. Uh, these are all the kinds of things to improve the delivery of care. Administrative complexity. Again, can you use um, electronic health records for, let's say, smart prior authorization? How do you use electronic health information to reduce the administrative burden on providers? Can you get information just out of uh, you know, an EHR that just submits to um, uh, a health plan for prior authorization and all that can kind of occur automated? Um, can a provider's uh, request be approved a certain percentage of time that they kind of uh, get waived out of the PA requirement so they can just go ahead and provide those services. So again, there's a way to reduce administrative comp uh, complexity and burden through EHRs. Um, I'm just jumping out to fraud and abuse. Again, uh, being a responsible steward of taxpayers' funds, we want to ensure program integrity, and again, the use of clinical information can help us to oversee effective, efficient care was provided um, to search for abuse and waste. Uh, so these are all the kinds of things uh, that can help us um, more effectively and efficiently administer the Medicaid program. Um, so what are we doing now uh, you know, for the Medicaid program? We're, we're really at the infancy, and we're just trying to create the infrastructure. So this is kind of the business case. Um, but we need to build that infrastructure to allow the exchange of health information. Um, um, so one of the things we're doing is the um, Medicaid Electronic Health Record Incentive Program. Uh, there's a provision in the Affordable Care Act. Uh, there's also a provision for the Medicare Electronic Health Record Incentive Program. Uh, under the Medicare EHR Incentive Program, uh, about $37 million has come to Hawaii in incentives for meaningful use of electronic health records. And the Medicaid program was recently launched. In September, uh, providers could begin attest, uh, attesting in the national level repository. And beginning in October, they could do it in the state level repository. They could do both steps. And then beginning in October, they could start um, attesting to meaningful use. So we had, uh, as of November 14th, 208 eligible professionals, 14 eligible hospitals had registered on the national level. Um, 26 eligible professionals in six hospitals at the state level. Uh, two have attested to meaningful use, and payments have commenced. Um, so we're, we're real happy that uh, we're, we're able to launch this program um, to incentivize providers to begin the meaningful use of EHRs. Uh, the other thing we're working on is uh, supporting um, Beth and her role and the Hawaii Health Information Exchange, again, to support that infrastructure. So you kind of have to build it, and you have to build the exchange itself, get providers to um, interface uh, with the exchange, and, and really get that critical mass of folks to participate, to then have enough people where the information can be exchanged because all these providers are participating. So we're really at the very early stage of trying to get providers onboarded um, onto the information exchange. And again, primarily we're doing it right now through our incentive program, uh, through supporting the Hawaii Information Exchange. And we also actually have some requirements in our contracts with health plans. Um, in our uh, value-based purchasing requirements where we require our health banks to have uh, a certain amount of the provider network of value-based purchasing, with, you know, pay for performance kinds of things, that if a primary care provider uses electronic health records that they can get reimbursed a little bit more. So those are kind of some of our leverage points to try and advance this. And uh, with that, I'm sure the time is up, so uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming to the session. Um, I want to give you a perspective on health IT from a physician as well as a um, hospital medical center perspective. You know, things are changing very fast in healthcare, and the healthcare you see right now and the connectivity we see right now is really at the early stages. And I want to start with a series of questions for you to imagine or think about from the last time you were in your doctor's office or when a family member was in the hospital. How were they collecting the information? Where was that information going? What information do you think they already know about you 
that's correct and what information that you, they might already have about you that's incorrect. And I would also ask is, has any of you tra um, transferred and switched doctors? How easy is that? You know, most of them are, a lot of them are on paper. You know, years from now, it's not going to be on paper. And as uh, Dr. Fink was saying, a lot of money is being spent to digitize things, right? There's federal incentives and state incentives for people to get onto EMRs, electronic medical records. And doctors who are at the end of their careers, some are choosing to retire because they don't know how to do email. They don't know how to log on. They don't know how to click and use the mouse. And then you have the younger generations who are, it's, it's easy, it's, it's okay. But that, so that's, that's the first picture of what's out there. And even the people who are using pen and paper, there is tons of data being collected about all of us, right? When we're on the web, you know, Google's collecting stuff about us, Yahoo's collecting stuff about us, all the websites you go into, the same thing is happening on the, on the healthcare side. So I think of you know, my docs, most of them are on paper. There's information already digitized about me, and that's on the claims side of things. Right now, organizations, Queen, or um, HMSA, Kaiser, any of your insurers right now have troves of data if you've ever hit the healthcare system, from your PCP visits to hospitalizations, ER visits, medications, everything. Um, and so that's that's the first part that I, I, I know this is a healthcare IT summit, and I, hope, and I think you guys know that. But when you really bring it home to yourself, what does that mean for you? as well as then the systems we're creating for all our colleagues and our communities and what, what happens with this information. Which gets to the next question I have is, what do people do with this information? Sure, when we see our doctor, we want them to know pretty much everything about us because that affects the clinical decisions and where they, the trajectory of where they want to take us in terms of our health. But what if it's used for different purposes? And I'll propose to you it's used in a ton of ways. Um, two jobs ago, I was up in, up in the mainland we had about 20 million people's health data. We got it from the insurers. It was all stuff, when you sign up for HMSA, you sign up for Kaiser, you've said, hey, you can use it. Um, and my job was to understand, who are your diabetics? Who are the diabetics that aren't getting the things that are done? Who are the ones that have been in the hospital? And using predictive models to say, wow, I wonder, who's the next person that's gonna be in the hospital next? And it's all been used for good purposes, but as Eric Snowden and others have shown, there could be other ways to use the data that people don't want or we don't want. And I would say, you know, if you have a role in helping connect us, you really do have to think about what are the uses, right? I mean, and I'll use a real example of saying, all right, so we created an algorithm to, with a pretty high reliability saying these are your diabetics based on just your visits to the doctor or not. And let's say it was 95% accurate, but there was a 5%, you know, fudge factor of we kind of think you are, but we're not really sure. Well, you get mailers, and currently, HMSA, all the insurers across the nation, send people who they think might be able to benefit from services to say, oh, you know, Mr. Mr. Lin, you've been in the hospital. We think you could benefit from this. We have a 1-800 number. Talk to us about your, your disease. We could help you. At what point does it get too intrusive, right? They could say, hey, there's the latest and greatest iPad app or you know, iPhone app that we could sell you? Does that cross the boundary or not? Or does that help you? And so the usability of our data, it's being collected now, and as we digitize more, it'll be used even more. And we really have to safeguard that in the right way. And I don't think there's clear answers on what is safe. The next thing that I think about is the security of the data. Um, my favorite example, it was unfortunate, but about three years ago, um, a well-meaning um, manager of a clinic in Pat Mass General, where I was at, um, decided to take over work. We all take over work, right? For better or for worse, the billing information had its social security number, and it was for a research project. It had diagnoses, age, sex, address, and it had an unfortunate thing because the research at the clinic was on HIV. So those members, oh, so, so she took it home, and unfortunately, on the subway, left the digital, she left the laptop, never been found again. And so, you know, we all have paper records now, all of us, right? And a lot of us have digital records, our doctors have. But as we digitize, that speed with which things could be stolen or compromised is extremely real. And that brings it home, and obviously there's um, lawyers who try to a class action lawsuit against Mass General, et cetera. But I would propose to you that that's not rare. 
that's actually more commonplace than you believe. And we all worry about our financial stuff on the internet and things that are moving around. As we digitize, security of our information is, is paramount. And I think, um, again, it's something we have to consider. And the last thing I, I, I think about for the provider side is the enormous cost that's being invested in this. You know, Queens, HMSA, Kaiser, HPH, they've all invested tens of millions of dollars and are continuing to invest. And my organization, Mono Memorial, was part of the state system, HHSC. And um, our electronic medical record um, and its public information over the next five years will cost almost $110 million. And you talk about, you know, Dr. Fink was saying about taxpayer money, et cetera, and how is it being used. It's a requirement that we need to get digitized, but are we doing it in the right way? Is the money being spent in the right way? All of those questions come about, and, um, and the individual providers themselves, buying computers for each room, getting the software, getting the updates, worried about the security, getting um, as things, you know, encrypted flash drives, whatever it may be, um, and training the staff on what they can and can't do to keep it secure. Those are all real key considerations as we fast forward through um, healthcare, IT, and digitizing. Uh, and it's the right thing to do, but there's certainly a lot of things to think about as we go forward on this front. Thank you. Patterns of diagnosis and you know, 
outbreaks of calm, the spikes of clusters of fever. That's going on here as we speak. And that's something I think we all want a, a, a system to have as long as it's secure, anonymous, and so on and so forth. So that's, that's going fairly well. What we're really waiting for is we're in at the front to make sure that the back end, stage three, population health management, um, we, we, really, we really, as a society, need to pull that off. Right now, like I said, the Department of Health has a lot of epidemiological data. So much of it is self report Some of our most important measures, um, how heavy are you, your BMI, to make it easy, sometimes what disease you have, diabetes, for example. <coughs> there are, they're self-reported. We call people up and put this in delicate. You know, how much do you weigh? And where do you live? And how, really, how accurate is that? You know, my driver's license is entirely accurate. I'm, I'm taller and, and lighter. I'm leaner in my driver's license. Yeah. <laughs> it's the photo that tells me that. That, that. Yeah, that's why they can't reconcile the photo. That's, that's, that's kind of um, and that's where we are really needing to make sure that the seeds we sow now pay off in the future. There should be a point in time where we can calculate the diabetes incidence rate in the year, calculate the diabetes prevalence in the year, not estimate it, which is kind of what we do with sort of representational samples. And then we also need to start knowing where people live. It would be nice to know what their education level was and how much money they made, but this is where the public health department will come in and try to shape policy, public policy, to see where the disparities are. And that's really the end of it. So I just kind of want to leave you with that thought that, yeah, your experience the next time you see your physician or a provider, um, because they're not all physicians, they can be a nurse or something else like that. Um, you know, that's here and now in your life. And, and you know, part of that data will come to the department anonymously and we will add it so that we can get a bigger picture of things. But the more we get folks to invest in using and being comfortable with electronic medical records in their day-to-day -day medical care transactions, um, the richer all of our lives will be because we will be able to measure and manage these things more precisely. And that's really the premise of public health, is population health management. What are the most fundamental levers that we can push to move a tick 1%? When we're talking about a million people, 1% of anything cost death. Um, disease burden, prevalence, is a lot. Um, so I just kind of want to leave you with that thought as you're working through this, that, that you know, there are, there are, there's more one, there's more than one prize to keep your eye on. One is that we all want to walk into a doctor's office and not prescribe something that's instantly going to um, interact with the last uh, drug that the, our, you know, our, our last physician prescribed to us. That we walk into an ER that they're not going to inject us with something that we're allergic to. But we also want to make sure that that data is there, and those systems are built, that we think ahead to beyond that clinical transaction so that we can really set, have really evidence-based, best practice-based public policy. And that's really, that's really the eye on, that's where the, the Department of Health's eye is right now. And that's where we're going to see great systems change and see everybody's uh, both rise for the rising tide. So that's my quantification. So thank you. <laughs> to remember what, why we're doing what we're doing in the, the um, opening session this morning was very apropos, uh, you know, to this effort of knowing where we're going or knowing where we want to get to in order to, to actually get there. So I wanted to stop and just see if, uh, understand who's actually in the audience. So how many people actually work in health, in IT, just technology? Okay, and how many people work in healthcare? Some. And um, how many people are from the neighbor islands today? One. Thank you. Um, uh, the, the Hawaii Health Information Exchange is the organization that I work for. It is a nonprofit, and we've heard a lot of different aspects about healthcare. But I want to give you a, 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 a different perspective, and that is that there are about maybe 15 hospitals in the state of Hawaii. And um, most of those hospitals are on 
multiple different electronic health care record systems, and most of those hospitals don't communicate with each other. They're on different electronic health record systems. The, 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 and I see some heads nodding. So each system and each facility was built separately and differently and independently. And that, that's the hospitals. Then you take the independent physicians out in the community, the internists and the specialists that you see. Most of them are in small independent physician practices. And there are probably about you know, 4,000 4, licensed physicians and maybe, maybe about 2,000 office-based physicians. And they each have about 30 or so different electronic healthcare record systems. So when we're trying to improve the delivery of care and ensure that we're actually able to do these things around these slides, when you show up into a provider practice or a physician practice, we want to make sure that your physician knows critical information about yourself so they can treat you better, um, so he or she can treat you better. Um, we're challenged right now where, when physicians have different systems that don't talk to each other. So we're really embarking right now um, on a journey to create standards in order for electronic healthcare record systems to communicate with each other um, so that the care becomes organized and coordinated. So it's, it's, it's very similar to the banking industry, I guess, where you stick your ATM, you can be traveling in, in France and stick your ATM card in there and, and somehow the system is able to recognize who you are, um, understand uh, where your bank account is and you can get some, some cash out of the system. Um, the, the healthcare industry is, is a, a bit more fragmented than that. And so these are the things that we're really focusing on, and the infrastructure becomes very, very critical to enable us to, to do that. Um, the Hawaii Health Information Exchange helps in two fronts, as was alluded to earlier. One of the things that we do is we help physicians implement electronic health record systems. They're, they're very, very busy people, and they actually prefer to spend their time delivering care than um, talking onto a laptop and looking at the computer versus talking to you. And those are things we really need to, to work towards. Um, that's, that's just not uh, implementing a technology, but it's also helping them to change their workflow to really adapt to, to the, the tools that technology brings into the marketplace. The other thing that we're doing is connecting the different 15 hospitals on the different electronic health record systems and 30 different electronic healthcare record systems in the 2,000 independent physician practices across the state of Hawaii so that they can provide better care. It is a journey that we're on and we work in, in great partnership with a lot of the people that you see up here. Um, privacy and security is of, of the utmost concern and so we take very deliberate small steps to move towards that journey. So that, that's all I have and, and thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, I'm not cool. My entries are not quite as good looking. Uh, but to the doctors, I did bring my apple a day, so uh, trying to stay healthy. Thanks, everyone, uh, for your time this afternoon. Uh, my name is Eric Albert, I'm the Deputy Executive Director of the Hawaii Health Connector. Um, and I just wanted to spend just a few minutes kind of explaining who we are um, and, and what we do. Um, as a starting point, um, I also want to thank uh, the governor's office, uh, Herb Schultz, who's out here from HHS representing um, Kathleen Sebelius, our, our secretary, and also uh, giving us the important funding that we need in order to, to implement our exchange. Um, and a lot of familiar faces out there in the audience. Um, I don't see Sonny Bagwalia, the state CIO, but he's also been um, a great partner as we've um, implemented our exchange. Um, so uh, where are we? Well, our system is working. Uh, a lot of folks out there have said it's not. Uh, 257 people in the last Friday have signed up. Um, so, so the technology is working. I think there's been a lot of questions um, as to sort of where the technology is, a lot of folks have, have been wondering, you know, where was the plan selection, how do I have more coverage, how does the process work? And I guess, you know, I sort of want to level set where we are and also um, maybe uh, offer, an, offer an opportunity to everyone to sort of figure out how the process works. 
Um, so let's let's maybe start by talking sort of um, what we are. We're a state-based marketplace. And what that means is that we are sort of on the other side of the fence from, from what a lot of folks have been talking about. We're out there to, to provide coverage, right? There's, um, in Hawaii, we're fairly lucky. We, the, the uninsured rate is only 8%. Um, but we also have uh, the tradition of the Prepaid Care Act, which is a lot of small businesses who offer uh, coverage to their to their employees. So we're we're aggressively targeting that, that uninsured rate. Uh, some of those folks, uh, Kenny and uh, as administrator of MedQuest, will, will bring them through the, the, the Medicaid expansion. Uh, a lot of those other folks are, are going to have tax uh, credits or other subsidies, um, and those folks will be able to get coverage through the connector and still others who um, may not be eligible for those those tax credits or subsidies can, can buy coverage through us that probably um, or, or maybe at least um, a lesser amount than, than maybe what they're paying today and that's all thanks to um, the market reforms in the Affordable Care Act which sort of do away with the kind of lesser uh, than average or, or sort of junk coverage as folks have said that it currently is on the marketplace. Um, so where are other states? Um, there's 15 other state-based marketplaces in, in the District of Columbia. Um, Oregon, unfortunately, still hasn't launched their exchange at all yet. Um, they're, they're working on doing that, but have deployed about 400 people to fill out paper applications. Um, in Washington, um, they went down for a couple of days um, after they launched. Um, but there was about 8,000 people that unfortunately got a wrong calculation on tax credits. So they were doing it um, on, a, on a monthly instead of an annual basis. So all those people that thought they got tax credits, um, sorry folks, that you're not going to get tax credits. So that, that was a bit of a um, struggle for them. Um, and um, we saw that many states really didn't wait uh, or waited until uh, November to, to launch some key components, plan selection for example. So comparing two plans, um, that, that functionality wasn't even there in some states until um, early um, November. And then a lot of states have, have experienced significant amount of downtime. So there is no uh, shopping for health insurance uh, when you're in your pajamas at home, uh, awake at 1 a.m. in the morning. Uh, that just might have been downtime that, that the system was occurring. So, um, here in Hawaii, um, since October 15th, we've been up and running. Plan selection is working. The tax credit calculation is working. Um, and folks are signing up for coverage. Um, so I think that that's a pretty significant uh, milestone for us um, and, and our work with, with DHS to make sure that any individuals who are seeking financial assistance can go through DHS, come over to us, um, and get enrolled in coverage. Um, so with that, I think that maybe we'll stop there and, and get back to that. Okay, well then. <laughs>
um, uh, individuals having access to their uh, health care information is a very, very big part of this and certainly around uh, meaningful use, it really is about making sure that the provider side, if you will, has the ability to be able to, through electronic medical records, to be able to not only better manage care and sort of community and population health and individual health and family health, uh, but can really connect, if you will, and, and I think many of you are probably, whether you're in hardware or software or applications or integration, you know, may have been involved in some of that in Hawaii. So the two other initiatives, I'm going to leave health reform maybe to Q&A because I think Eric did a great job and that is really, for here, that is a, a Hawaii issue, um, is very specifically about two things that you may or may not know about. And there are two federal initiatives, but trying to get them, if you will, it's not, it's really federal framework, but it's really state, local, and what I like to call indigenous, tribal, territorial, uh, implementation in Region 9 because we're a region, just so you know, 50 million people, uh, Hawaii, California, Arizona, Nevada, Guam, American Samoa, uh, CNMI, Commonwealth of Northern Marianas Islands, Micronesia, Palau, and Marshall Islands. So that's when I look out about this region, the importance of Hawaii, and the importance of the Pacific, and the importance of, um, I have a favorite word, but it's not a real word, and you're taking this, electronicizing. Thanks. So don't quote me on that. Two quick things. Anyone here hear about the Blue Button Initiative? Okay, so one. Okay, this is an initiative that started with the Veterans Administration. It's now the Veterans Administration and the Department of Health and Human Services in coordination with the White House. But what it really is all about is we focus on electronic medical records in the provider side. It's about electronic health records, personal access to individuals and families to be able to utilize those individual health records. Whether or not they come from the health care provider uh, or the health care plan, it is a secure environment in a way to be able to utilize, and I think this is from the stimulus where a lot of folks, I was working for Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger at a time, and, and um, actually Eric and I worked together in overseeing stimulus implementation in California. And so there was so much talk then about how do you go from an EMR to now putting that information in the hands of consumers. And I think the work that you do has a lot of, of um, transference here, I guess, is what I'll say. And so there are already 450 organizations, uh, including those in Medicare, that are uh, involved in, if you will, this initiative. But beginning in January, we will have, if you will, a connector on uh, our websites and be promoting a connector so that individuals and families across the country can begin to, one, know who, what providers, what organizations already are signed on to this initiative and can provide that information, whether it's visits, claims data, uh, 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 prescription drugs that people are taking, or even, you know, sort of vaccination records, and stored on mobile devices, flash drives, um, all of that is sort of available under that. So that's sort of issue one, and something from the Secretary of Office of National Coordinator, the Obama administration, a very, very important initiative. The other one is, how many of you have heard of the Health Data Initiative? Okay, so one and one, so you two can leave because you know all about this stuff. But the other one I want you to know about, because this is also a very big one, whether, again, you do hardware, software, um, applications, things like that. And without getting too technical, there's sort of two pieces about it, because you can be far more technical than me. One is that it is the first time ever that there are historic proportions of federal, state, local, county, city, you know, community level data in many different areas that now are available, if you will, to both technologists that are looking at 
um, you know, health disease prevention promotion that businesses are looking at in terms of how do we provide performance, uh, but also for organizations to look at and all of us to look at is there quality health care that's cost effective, you know, that's fighting disease prevention. But the other part of it, which I think is sort of the exciting part, how many of you work in sort of the application side of this? Okay. How many of you deal somewhat with the software side? Okay. And the rest of you are hardware? Or a lot of other things, I'm sure. But the positive thing about this is you may have heard of this term, data palooza. But we've now had, you know, not only sort of four national, but a lot of different data palooza's because the Health Data Initiative has turned into something, part of it called the Health Data Consortium. And there are technology companies where the opportunities are out there given to people working on applications to basically try and come up with the latest, greatest ways in order to be able to help somebody manage, say, disease progression, to help people, um, again, with system performance, to help people with understanding whether there is uh, quality, affordable health care that's being sort of provided. So, you know, from, from the 360 degree level, you look at these two things, and it's all about, one, putting the information in the hands of the consumer, but also putting it in the hands of business to make sure that the care that's being provided and the coverage is provided is high quality care. So these are some of the things, but sort of from this macro standpoint of the federal government, meaningful use, you know, blue button, um, the issue around health data initiative and giving significantly historic proportions of data at, you know, just the, the most basic level to be able to work on things like the business side, the disease prevention and promotion side, and really looking at the system performance side. So that's what we're up to. So thank you very much. response to the things that they had to say. Is anybody ready to step forward with that? So while you're thinking, <laughs> of course I have a few, um, I would like to turn to Les and to Chris, um, who talked about different aspects of really the same kind of thing. We need to have health information um, readily available to improve our healthcare system, and yet there also is a dark side of that. And so can you talk more about your perspective of data governance and security, and how far should we go and where should we be cautious? That's <laughs> Thank you, Beth. Data governance and security. Um, the roadmap for health information exchange, connecting physicians and healthcare providers together to share information. We spend a lot of time um, discussing, the stakeholders discussing what is the most critical information that needs to be shared at a given point in time to start off with. And what does the laws, the current laws, allow us to uh, allow the system to share? So even though it sounds wonderful that we're sharing, you know, we want to share um, health information across the community so providers have that information at their fingertips, there is a very, very deliberate process. Um, none of the hospitals or physicians want to be, want to be sued for breach of a HIPAA contract. Um, they, take that, they take that very, very seriously to the point of actually not wanting to participate in a health information exchange or not wanting to share information electronically. Maybe their paper records are just fine. That's something that's in their office. That's something that they can control. 
So in order for the a system to actually work effectively, there has to be trust among a core group of stakeholders, or the community group of stakeholders, to build an understanding of the, of the policies that really govern exchange, to analyze the current state and federal laws that allow information to be exchanged, and to inform the public in a very transparent way of what that roadmap actually looks like. And so um, we are actually starting off very small. Um, in the case of the Hawaii Health Information Exchange, the first set of data that we're actually exchanging is um, admission and discharge, I guess patient demographic information. So when you're admitted into a hospital or discharged from a hospital, there's some basic information about you. And clinical summaries. Those are data sets that um, are exchanged today. Um, if a provider needs to give care to you, that's what they're looking for when they get a fax from the hospital, when they call a physician up on the phone, it's the most common set of data. So it's not anything new. It's just really helping the providers get the information that they that they needed in order to deliver better care. And then we build from that. So it's a very small deliberate process to the point where um, some stakeholders actually think we're moving too slow. Big data, everyone wants data and to do all these wonderful things, but it's for us, I think we do take privacy and security very seriously and um, very deliberately. So that, so that he can actually join our health information exchange. Um, I'll just say something briefly. Um, you know, certainly Christine is the expert on that front. You know, but I think it's a balance, right? I mean, you can't go so slow and be so cautious about what you share that nothing gets shared. But you can't just be so free that all our personal information is out there floating around where anyone could use for good or bad purposes. Um, whether, whether right or wrong, I think you know, we ourselves as patients should own that information. And um, there probably is at some point some, someone who's thought of that at the point of care, you should be able to sort of un unencrypt it at that point for the doctor to say, hey, you have my permission, here's the encryption key to get all the information you have. But the problem with that is then if it's all an opt-in system, then not all of us are going to get around to opting in. And as I'm already talking about, the, the holy grail is population health management, where you're going to need to know, or you should know about the whole population of what's the ins and outs of what's happening. So there, it, it's certainly a, a tight balance. Um, but I, I think at some point down the line, there will be, um, when you see the doctor, some type of encryption, some type of agreement where you say, hey, this is the, the security code to get into. My, my chest of what, what's out there. And, and maybe there's that basic data set that everybody agrees, you know, name, age, weight, height, that gets transferred anyways and maybe type of insurance. But anything beyond that in terms of diagnoses gets into this realm that it's not exchanged as quickly. But I'm certainly not an expert on that. If you don't know, mind me uh, jumping in, uh, one of the things that I failed to mention during my, my five minute spiel was that from a state perspective, governance of which security and privacy is a subset some discipline, um, is really the name of the game uh, right now. Um, as of July 1st, 2013, the state CIO is legally on the hook at, uh, for information, privacy, and security. There was a law that was passed in the legislature that pins that responsibility on the state CIO. Um, in, in the Department of Health, we deal with very, very sensitive data, your HIV, um, perhaps your, some of your family planning, your mental health diagnosis if you're, if you're a recipient of care from us. Very, very sensitive things. And as Dr. Chen said, you know, our ethical and professional standard in healthcare and public health is that this information belongs to you. We are stewards of that data. Uh, this is stuff about your you and your life. Um, and the technology is moving faster. I mean, we've heard this a lot, right? but the technology is moving faster than our ability to sort of trust each other for one, as, as business entities, and to, and to find those um, artifacts of, of, of policy and contracting that will support that. Um, if HH, I think for me, the root issue of a successful exchange, it, it, this is not a technology problem. Because high tech and all these other incentive programs require a certification for um, these products to be used in a meaningful way, to meet meaningful use, the market will force those um, applications out that don't meet 
being could use standards. So technology is not the issue. And, and the standards are fairly clear, and the emerging can be clearer, and those who want to be in the game are going to have to develop applications and protocols that meet those standards. Uh, if anything grinds this to a halt, it will be policy. Um, policy around security, policy around governance. Um, and so the point of what I'm saying is that um, if you were in the governance panel, you heard a lot about it. But for those of you who didn't, that the, the governor's office and the state CIO's office are walking all of the departments through a governance project right now. The Hawaii Data Council has been set up, for those of you who are not aware, and it's uh, made up of a representative from each department to discuss governance issues. And it means different things to different people, access control, appropriate use, um, what and where and when are we going to use this information, and so on and so forth. So that is where I think the real, real work, work is for a successful exchange in the private space and the public space and for attaining that holy grail of population out there. Um, the techies are going to save us, and all due respect to the lawyers, they won't save us. They, they will make sure we stay out of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I'm just wondering, on what role will some of the large stakeholders play in some of these initiatives? Are you finding they're helping it along, or are you finding them being resistant to some of your initiatives? Uh, for example, a uh, new web initiative or integration of data across uh, many providers. What role are they playing now, and what role do you see them playing in the future? Like Paging the state, for example, or Kaiser? If, if, if you're based off of HMSA, um, and I'll take the other two large hospital systems, Queens and North Pacific Health, um, they are very, they, they understand the value of providers exchanging relevant information with each other. They understand, uh, in the case of the hospitals, they understand that in order for them to communicate effectively with the providers that are in the community, whether they're, on, they're in Kailua, or whether they're in Wahiwa, or whether they're, they're in uh, the southern coast of the, of the Big Island, um, not everyone has the same system. So they're interested and they understand that uh, systems need to talk to each other because care needs to be coordinated for the betterment of the patient. I think they have different um, paces at which they'd like to move and different policies, and so the goal is uh, the good news is that they're actually at the table and they actually sit at um, that's have healthcare transformation um, work groups and it, it is hard work but uh, I'm, I'm glad that they're, they're there uh, okay. no, I was just going to say from from a regional and national perspective I think you know all of the stakeholders are, are at the table I mean we have worked with uh, you know consumer and nonprofit organizations as much as we've worked with provider uh, providers of all sort of stripes and um, provider organizations who I think are very interested in that um, one the notion of electronic medical records increased coverage or increased access but then how to better treat uh, you know disease and so uh, just sort of overall the point I wanted to make is yes I think the providers are there but even if you look at um, consumers and a lot, frankly, in the business community, who are you know looking at options of um, you know getting the most value for the health insurance policies that they buy, want to make sure that the insurers that are providing that coverage are working with providers that are integrated and coordinated. You know, sort of that's the whole overall goal of the ACA is to make sure you're providing. Uh, you know, coordinated integrated care between primary care and specialty care between physical health and behavioral health. So I think it's a much larger $19 billion just for the notion of HIT. $19 billion. So that really took care of sort of the technology infrastructure. That was followed up by the Affordable Care Act. And for those of you who maybe who aren't so familiar with the policy side, so we have high tech that really said, you know, let's build up a high tech. A, a health information technology infrastructure. And then it's, it's followed up, and it's just brilliant the way this one two punch works, with the Affordable Care Act, which around this IT world and the clinical interaction, payment policy 
So to get back to your question, where are the big players and how are they pushing? They are pushing them. Obviously, with the resources, as a state person, we need to make sure that they're not trying to recreate the world in their own image. But our local players are very good. They've been here a long time. Um, but they are also being influenced by changes in things and different focuses on the quality. So we have that dynamic that's also bringing them to the table. That's aligning the goals and the, and the rewards and the penalties for providers and, and insurers alike. So yeah, they're at the table. Yes, they're making a difference um, just by size. They're, 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 they're moving us in, in a direction. Um, but there are other forces out there that are also pushing us together to, to achieve this interoperability and health information exchange. And that's, it's just brilliant how some of these things, I mean, tech, there's been some technology issues, uh, operational issues, but and from a policy perspective, it's really neat to see all of these things aligned with payment, technology, and utilization, um, and hopefully at the end, population management. So there's a lot of forces that are pushing the big players to make the right decisions that will benefit all of us, and not just their market segment. Okay, I'll turn it over to Dr. Fink mentioned, you said two of uh, Healthcare providers have signed up for the um, incentives program, and I'm wondering, with all of the investment in this, is there a breaking point where where our investment breaks even? Essentially, how many doctors need to sign up, and providers need to sign up for this to be financially feasible, as well as the policy? Dollars 
to upgrade your enrollment and eligibility systems and do things that you need to do as a state, regardless of how. There's obviously a, a governor here that we're grateful, stakeholders that have bought in fully to the notion of the implementation of the ACA as the catalyst to transformation. But I think Kenny's point is a good one because it came with significant financial reimbursement out of ACA in addition to what came, um, you know, from our. My question has to go to the blue button and the public data initiative. A lot of money has been spent on the data being gathered, and most people in IT who look at the big data that is out there walk away with a big headache. Because people use different terms to mean the same item, depending on which side of the table you're on, as well as whether you're public or private. And then when you try to deliver something like that to the consumer, the idea of the consumer having any control over their medical records is one that is very popular with consumers, but almost impossible to deliver because there's so much information that would be available. So those two initiatives, I'm finding very interesting how they're going to come together with all the money that's already been spent on data initiatives in healthcare. Where is that going over the next iterations with ACA and what we're doing right now? It's a great series of questions. Um, I, I think where we are right now in trying to, you know, there's 450 organizations that are sort of participating, uh, but it's largely been a, um, you know, it is a growing initiative. What we're trying to do with this connector organization, just connect in terms of an online um, site, uh, is to try and ramp that up. And I think there are a lot of conversations going on about um, you know, consumers will have to manage uh, that. And so what type of data is out there? So not being the technical expert, I know there's a lot of questions about um, is it solely uh, prescriptions and uh, you know, immunizations? Can you, what, what access is there to claims data? Is that important to this or to not to there? So I think that all of it is just an ongoing, uh, and I'm more than happy to provide my information. I'd love to hear from, from people about that um, because it's really just sort of, you know, VA um, is the one that we aim at. Now it's a part of the world. Right. I think, I think sometimes, you know, it's like, well, there's all of this data, and then it's sort of, okay, what, what is that really meaningful? Um, I hope it's going the way that it's like the EMR is pretty standardized. When I've been in different types of organizations, it seems it's really pretty standardized about what sort of information we have. Not all this information is power, but we need to sort of understand uh, the information that's there. I, mean, I will get into the standpoint of not just a certain policy guide. Um, I've been working with each other for 22 years. And I went to my specialist uh, three weeks ago. Uh, and, you know, doctors, I mean, the same doctors, how policy guy. Some of the worst when it comes to get to the doctor on time. So I was late. And, you know, he sort of, you know, because we're friends, he sort of, sort of, you know, uh, I asked him a question. This is all electronic now. And did you know I have a hub and you can look at this data? And I did go back on after it was there. And I thought it was just about right that I did find myself saying, how much would be too much for me to do? Because I don't know what billing rubens are. I know what, you know, my viral load is that got non-detectable. But, but that's information that's important to me. The other information about what prescriptions I have would be important to me. So I think it's an on, all, all of this I think is an ongoing dialogue. The reason the data initiatives put so much out there is because there's been this sort of dam where you know, academics and researchers and organizations, there's been nothing out there. And so in an attempt to provide significant open government, Todd Parker, 
who is now the Chief Technology Officer uh, uh, in the White House. My boss, Secretary Sebelius, calls it the CTO for America. Um, he was the first CTO of the HHS. So that's the nice thing, that there's leadership in addition to the President setting the standard. And Todd is there in the White House, knows health, he's from Silicon Valley, he's a technologist. How do you all see clinical disease registries and public health registries being used in the future in this uh, interoperable environment, uh, especially for managing chronic disease um, and patient patients through initiatives like the button?
As for public health, I mean, Kenny, you didn't steal any thunder because I don't think there's too much thunder to steal from public health. Um, I mean, we do a lot, but you know, what we're really talking about is almost not quite to see as many as you know, but that it is that new space that's going to be created for public health. That's not necessarily public health. Public health has three main functions in the classical sense, assessment, policy development, and assurance. We generally uh, try to go after environmental and systems change. Um, social marketing, uh, and regulatory powers, and so on and so forth. Um, we are talking about the healthcare space in this case, and that new bubble, not, not even a bubble, the rest of the, the planet outside of the exam room and the hospital doors is where we all live our lives, and that's where, you know, I used to, I used to run the, that disease management program for the Hawaii's largest insurer, and we did diabetes disease management, and I was set up for the do all that sort of stuff. And that was, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, that was the flavor of the month, the season manager. Um, and that can only go so far because people will trust their physician or provider face to face more than their insurance company, no matter how trustworthy their insurance company is. So it, these registries will hopefully, along with payment reform and what, what the two physicians on either side of them say, will create incentives and new professional levels like community health workers. We are, we've already seen this happen in Oregon where they will send somebody out to the house and they'll enter your refrigerator, check up on you once a week, count your pills, um, look to see if you've got brown rice and, or, or using something, you know, so that's where the real opportunity lies. It is to I actually segment those populations but target them with the most appropriate intervention. Public health is probably still a little too remote in its classical sense to impact treatment, per se. But again, those registries for the sake of assessment, policy development, and assurance will be absolutely we are likely to be reporting this stuff. And that is the last word on Health IT today. Thank you very much. Thank you for participating.